The next gentleman coming to the stage is the senior economist, senior economist, and I don't even know what this means, but you'll tell me during the break. GSMA intelligence, that sounds so like, you know, secret stuff, black ops, whatever. Uh, please welcome to the stage, I'm gonna get this right because it's a great name, Federico Agnoletto. Did I do it? I did good? Okay. Federico, take the stage. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Let's get it going. Good to see you all. So I want to start with a little poll. Please raise your hand if you think fixed wireless access is cool. OK. Many skeptics. Yes, we're serious about it. So my name is Federico, I'm a senior economist at GSMA Intelligence. We do um, consulting, research, we sell data to the whole mobile ecosystem. So I wanna start with a little bit of market context here, the fixed broadband market. So it's kind of split between developed and developing countries. We have uh, developed countries that have reached saturation, let's say. So the pandemic has given a slight boost. Um, and then we have developing countries that where most of their growth in the market is going to happen. So, yeah, another way to see it is this slide. So most of the growth is going to be in developing economies, whereas in developed economies, there's just a little bit of growth expected. And the, the mix is shifting. New technologies come in, fixed wireless access, 5G fixed wireless access. So there are uh, countries where fiber leads, such as in APAC, such as China, uh, in Europe, in Spain. Uh, there's countries where cable is leading in terms of connections, and that's um, the US, some Latin American markets. And there are countries where naturally 5G fixed wireless access comes in, and it's, it's uh, the XDSL countries uh, where XDSL connections are the majority. So. Yes, the speeds. So 5G FWA can provide speeds of one to 10 gigabits per second, depending whether you use millimeter wave spectrum or not. And so they are pretty much comparable to fiber, to the home, and uh, coax. So this makes it com uh, competitive, and you know that's why it's popular again, I guess. It's popular again. We are tracking, we track the live networks, so we know that there are 74 uh, act, commercially active uh, fixed wireless access, 5G fixed wireless access markets, and this is gonna go up very soon to 90 uh, broadband providers in 43 countries. And it's all over the world, so I'm gonna go and jump in to give you some more context. So there, there's LTE, FWA, uh, so most of the um, networks are more than 500 networks uh, use 4G, 4G+. In terms of launches, we have more than 50% of markets where there's 5G commercially available have 5G fixed wireless access offerings. And so there's been lots of growth and lots of announcement, especially here in the US. So we think market adoption has been slow so far, but we're really bullish and we expect that, you know, connections are gonna reach 40 million in 2025. And stay tuned, if you got a subscription to our uh, website, you can access very soon our detailed forecast on this uh, topic. And in terms of CPEs, obviously, so according to GSA, there are 93 commercially available CPEs at the moment, uh, so, more than double with respect to uh, last year. And yes, this is about the um, money that governments are investing in improving infrastructure. So I had the chance to say yesterday, in Europe, 5G fixed wireless access is already recognized as an option to um, tackle the digital divide. Uh, so, and we hope that this is extends to other countries. But there's a lot of money on the table to improve you know, infrastructure and break the digital and the speeds divide. 
And these are some examples. I think uh, Ryan from Timo uh, gave a really nice introduction to this session. So uh, nice call out T-Mobile, uh, very bold statements about covering tens of millions of households on 5G FWA. Similarly for Verizon, I put I'm Italian, I put FastWeb. Uh, so FastWeb, they, uh, they wanna cover 50% of Italian households on 5G FWA, and they have a mid-band plus millimeter wave network, similarly to Verizon. Uh, recent announcement from US Cellular, uh, they are covering 10 cities with 5G FWA. And another nice example that I think is about the digital divide is Globe Telecom. So it's a Philippines um, operator and they are providing, they were the first operator to provide 5G fixed wireless access in Southeast Asia. So they have a plan about two terabytes uh, with minimum speeds of about 50 Mbps in the downlink. And this is rather self-explanatory, I would say. There's a premium if you offer 5G FWA with respect to 4G, so it's an opportunity to maximize the value of your assets. You, if you already have 5G uh, for smartphones, uh, you can take the chance and maximize the value of your assets by offering 5G FWA, and is also a chance to close or be closer to the um, leading fixed broadband technologies. So these are a couple of examples there. And this is about the uh, strategic opportunity. So in developing economies, 5G FWA is a good opportunity to drive first time broadband adoption. So targeting new fixed broadband users in underserved markets, XDSL for instance, or white areas, but also in developed and in developing economies where there are users that are looking for faster speeds and they don't wanna wait after the pandemic, I guess. It's also a good complement to fiber offerings. It doesn't have to be a substitute. Uh, there are always pockets where fiber doesn't, I mean, fiber can't go anywhere, everywhere, obviously. Yeah, sometimes it's really, really anti-economical to reach some premises or it takes a lot of time. So it's a good complement. And in terms of the enterprise, uh, small medium enterprises that are mostly suburbs, rural areas, but also those that are the, like construction sites that are temporary, um, there's a lot of opportunity there as well for operators. So we've done this, um, we've been work, working with our friends uh, with Qualcomm on some research on where and when 5G FWA is cost effective versus fiber to the home. We've been working on this for six to eight months and we, we've thought about it about three scenarios. So the first scenario is an MNO that has good millimeter wave spectrum availability, but small or limited sub six gigahertz spectrum available. The second scenario is about an MNO that has both good millimeter wave and sub six availability. And the third scenario, and, the, and there's a new report out today, it's about an internet service, service provider that is looking at deploying a greenfield fixed wireless access network and I'll come back to this, uh, but the recent announcement about you know, a millimeter wave only um, FWA network is very relevant because ISPs that are looking at providing this service don't have to buy very, very expensive mid-band spectrum. They can go millimeter wave only. So the first two scenarios are really relevant for um, operators that have a 5G network, mobile only or converged. And the third is ISPs or entrepreneurs that want to provide a new alternative in the market or enter new markets. So is it cost effective? Let's go through uh, the cost drivers first. So these are the cost drivers for fiber to the home. The most, most of the capex for fiber to the home is due to civil works. And there are these civil works costs, which include the cost of trenching, uh, building the ducts, or placing the poles and pulling the fiber cables. Um, 
represent the majority of the cost of building a FTTH network. And this is driven by local terrain characteristics, local regulations. So in our research, we distinguish between whether you deploy underground or overground, and whether you, can, you need to build the infrastructure, or whether you can rent it or share it with, from someone else. Then there's also the you know, fiber cables uh, cost, the splitters that are passive, they, they don't need to be powered. Uh, there's also some equipment that you need to um, add in the local exchange, in your local fiber exchange. And there's also, quite important, the uh, last drop to the customer premises. So when you need to connect the building, uh, we distinguish between that and building the access network. 5G FWA, so I'm not going to spend much time here, but there's the passive infrastructure that depends on your coverage and capacity needs. There's this active infrastructure, uh, the GNOB, the baseband, uh, the backhaul, power and software fees, which depend on the spectrum band usage, the coverage and capacity needs. And there's also the CPEs, which strictly depend on the number of subscribers you want to add. You add, and uh, whether you use outdoor units or outdoor CPEs that require a truck roll, and so there's an incremental cost to that. So there's a debate, indoor, outdoor, CPEs, what's best? So we built this very nice TCO model that takes into account a whole lot of factors to understand whether, when and when 5G FWA is cost effective versus FTTH. The key part is that we set a performance requirement of 100 megabits per second. So all the results I'm going to go through is 100 megabits per second in the downlink and 20 in the uplink, at least. So there's a lot of, um, we, uh, we look at a hypothetical area. We take real world data from satellite and we compare what, when and when, and then we look at sensitivities, right? So if you have 50% market share, 30%, uh, whether there's a lot of traffic at the busy hour or less traffic at the busy hour. And we also distinguish between what I just said about deploying fiber underground in ducts or overground on poles and whether you need to build them or you can rent them or share them. So these are the main levers that I'll, uh, when I will present the results I'll go through. So we have the population density and surface areas that are our baseline. So we look at the urban, suburban, and rural area, which is based on the density from the satellite. We look at data consumption, and we play with that to see whether, you know, if, if it grows more than expected, what happens? Is it still cost-effective FWA or not? The density in terms of buildings and roads, and the market share. On the supply side, so the performance requires requirements, like I said, we set 100 megabits per second, at least in uh, the downlink and 20 in the uplink. Uh, we look also whether, you know, 800 megs of millimeter wave or 400 megs, uh, does it improve the picture? It does. And uh, also on mid how much mid-band spectrum you have. The deployment mode is what I just said about underground versus overground and the capacity of the equipment, such as the uh, split ratio for g splitters. So this is the uh, millimeter wave only uh, FWA network versus FTTH for an MNO that already has a 5G network. So the idea here is that you already have, the base you already have some base stations in the area, and you provide for 5G FWA. Then depending on how strong demand is, we allow for densification, right? So we compare 5G millimeter wave FWA versus FTTH within 10 years. We assume 400 megs of millimeter wave and 40 megs of mid-bands. And we look at urban, suburban, and rural in Europe, US, and Latin America. So we find that really, Millimeter wave FWA is the go-to option in rural areas, and you can get up to 65% cost savings 
quite significant when you need to build new ducts, which is pretty common in rural areas that don't have this kind of infrastructure. In suburban, uh, it can also be cost effective when you need to build these new ducts or poles. And in urban, when you need to build the ducts. So forgot to mention, the cost costs you more to build the ducts than the poles, and obviously costs you more uh, to build them than to rent them. So that's the order of cost. So you can see there, uh, we also look at whether high power CPEs that, uh, whether they can improve the um, cost savings and they, and they do. So potentially they can improve cost savings. And this is the interesting part. So um, we play with these parameters and we look at whether you know, what's the level of market share where you would have the same cost or where 5G FWA is cost effective and FTTH is not. So obviously, the higher the traffic demand you have, the better picture for FTTH because it can support more traffic. However, millimeter wave band can, bands can support a lot of traffic. So it's, pretty, it's not that much elastic to demand. In terms of civil works, we also look at some thresholds. Uh, you can find in our reports uh, a lot of detail on that. But you can see that, you know, looking at thresholds, uh, when the cost per kilometer to build the, the ducts or the poles is above 50K, 50,000 per kilometer, and market share is below 30% in urban and in 50% in suburban, millimeter wave FWA is cost effective. It's also interesting the um, CP strategy. So whether you want to go, uh, we look at a hybrid strategy where you would go with outdoor CPEs for some premises that are farther away from the base station and indoor ones for those that are closer by. So this can improve cost savings uh, and high power CPEs can also improve cost savings. Second scenario, this is the uh, best looking one, um, a mid-band plus millimeter wave FWA network. So the idea here is that first you go with mid-band, and when, and when demand builds up where needed, you place millimeter wave cells to add, for added capacity. So we assume 400 megs in millimeter wave and 100 megs in mid-bands, uh, same perimeter of the study. And we see that when you need to build the new ducts or poles, the cost savings are huge. 80% in rural, 70% in suburban, and 45% in urban. And also, interestingly, we find that it's cost effective even when you can share these ducts. So even when you just need to pull the fiber cables, it can be cost effective. But this network is much more sensitive to traffic demand. So when traffic demand is moderate, like say around 30% market share, mid-band plus millimeter wave, we see it makes sense. When you have a lot more demand, <coughs> doesn't. So this is what I'm talking about in this kind of networks. Uh, high levels of market share and busy hour share when you need to build the ducts or the poles, but when you need to share them uh, and you have, for instance, a high busy hour share of traffic, uh, it's cost effective when market share is below 40% in rural and 20% in urban and suburban. We also look at whether you know, data consumption grows faster than we expect. Uh, and we see that FTTH is cost effective when BZ hour is ten, above 10% and market share is above 30%. And you see here that the thresholds in terms of civil works costs are pretty low. Uh, I don't think there exists a place where you can um, build ducks for $5,000 uh, per kilometer. In terms of you know, adding spectrum, this improves the picture. So the more spectrum you have, as you can imagine, does improve the picture. And that's why also we think it's um, future proof, because you can always add millimeter weight spectrum. And this is the third scenario that we just published. 
and it's about an ISP. So here we're looking at a greenfield deployment. The ISP needs to deploy the base stations from scratch. So here, like I said, we look at a millimeter wave only network, and this speaks to the announcement that was made about, you know, you can build your own millimeter wave only network, you don't need mid-bands. Why? Because mid-band is expensive, it's scarce, and you're an ISP, you want maybe to save some money on spectrum. So here, it is cost, FIGFWA is cost effective when the cost of deploying Flyber to the home includes the requirement to build the underground ducts. So that's the costly scenario. And so the cost savings improve when you look at a mid-band plus millimeter wave greenfield FWA network, but like I said, mid-band spectrum is expensive. So a millimeter wave only uh, 5G FWA network is not really elastic to traffic demand as the mid-bands plus the millimeter wave. So these are the thresholds in terms of civil works. The idea here, the intuition here is that when the cost of building the fiber infrastructure is high, 5G FWA is the go-to option. And when we look at, and when we assume that the cost of building fiber is above 100K per kilometer, 5G FWA is, is cost effective at any level of market share. And here as well, if you adopt this hybrid strategy of um, ODUs or outdoor CPEs for premises that are farther out from the base station and indoor ones for those that are close by, this can improve your cost savings because it saves you on, and it, it's quite significant because it saves you on new infrastructure, right? Same goes for indoor high power CPEs. And these are my key takeaways for today. So 5G FWA is a reality in many markets. It has a strategic rationale. It has regulatory recognition in Europe. And it has demand drivers. There are homes that need better speeds. 5G millimeter wave FWA is the go-to option for MNOs that have scarce mid-band assets, especially when new ducts or poles for fiber cables are needed. 5G mid-bands plus millimeter wave FWA is cost effective for MNOs even when you can rent or share the ducts or poles for fiber cables. And a greenfield 5G millimeter wave FWA, which we call the ISP scenario, but it can also be an entrepreneurial scenario, is cost effective when new ducts are needed, which is particularly relevant for rural areas. This is when you assume 100 megabits per second in the downlink and 20 megabits per second in the uplink. And these are the reports that we published. You can see the fourth one is out today, the ISP scenario. And I want to end up with, um, you know, we are in technology, so things move fast, and sometimes research moves slower than technology, I guess. So there are new things that can, can really change the economic picture of 5G FWA. And this is integrated access and backhaul, so you don't need to fiberize each and every tower. And we're also seeing uh, new companies that are offering repeater solution. And I see my good friend Brian there from Pivotal, uh, they are doing great. So these can change the economics. They can really improve. Um, they, you don't need to build G node Bs. You can use repeaters. This is not new, repeaters, but they're well suited for millimeter wave bands. And with this, I will take questions. Is there any question? Please. So, I've, you mean the data consumption or the uh, speeds? The tariffs, the, the cost. So we're seeing different differentiated uh, plans. So you can have like capped plans or unlimited plans. Right. You, we we see both. Okay. 
ya. Ya. Yeah, yeah, no, we're seeing that. So there are specific data plans with fixed wireless access that require a CPE that is fixed. So it's in a known location, so they know they can track where it is. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, but it's not what you're saying. So if ah. it is stock devices, that's, that's true. But for retail devices, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, All right. Thank you. Any other question? Yes? In terms of the uh, cost of buying fiber, you said it's not cost effective if it's uh, Thank you. less than uh, in the world where you can run it for less than uh, 5K per kilometer. Yeah. Um, can you give us sort of a little insight in terms of what are the most expensive places in the world and least to run fiber? And I, don't know, I guess more like penetration. I guess in North America, I think it's about only 40% of like base stations are even connected with fiber. Can you give us any insights there? Yeah. So. Uh, in our research, we found that these you know, costs of running fiber or building the fiber infrastructure, they vary a lot. And I heard you know, crazy numbers like from 5K to 100K per kilometer. And these, there are many factors that come in. The main factors that have been mentioned is you know, the terrain. Is it you know, granite or, uh, I don't know, uh, clay? Much easier to trench, right? And uh, whether it's mountainous or hilly or flat, that changes a lot the picture. It's also about regulatory red tape to some extent, right? You need to get the, the permission. So that's why it, there's also a time to market factor, right? So it's, uh, it takes way less time to uh, deploy 5G FWA than to deploy, deploy fiber to the home because you need to get all the relevant permissions. You start digging and it takes time. So these are the main factors. To give you another concrete example for urban areas, right? We are talking about urban areas. Think about Europe. We have all these beautiful cities with city centers that where there are archaeological remains. You, you don't want to dig there. You can't really de deploy fiber cables aerially because it's ugly, let's, let's be honest. So 5G FWA is a, is a good solution, right? You don't, you don't need to pull wires everywhere. You're welcome. Yes, there's a, yeah. So how does the sensitivity change? You said you modeled for 100 Mbps down and 20 up, but with a lot of you know working from home and things like metaverse and data consumption increasing, if you increase the speed to say 300 Mbps up or down and 100 Mbps up, how does this economics change? It does change a lot, especially for the mid-bands plus millimeter wave FWA mm -hmm. uh, network. Uh, it does change the, um, uh, the results. So we provide some sensitivities in the report in that regards. So when we double the performance requirements, we look at 240. Uh, we see that, for instance, the mid-bands plus millimeter wave FWA network is not cost effective when you can rent or share the ducts or poles for the fiber cables. So it, it, they do change. Uh, but we think, you know, at least 120, it's you know, it's fair, and it's at least. And with millimeter wave, you can get much more, right? So we've all seen the eight gigabits per second uh, data point. It's not on a fixed device, so you can get better, right, because it's fixed. I think the time is over, so it's time for lunch. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much.